In March 2005, <clears throat> in the Ross Sea of the Antarctic, the Ross Ice Shelf calved the world's largest ever recorded iceberg, B-15. Now, B-15 was 37 kilometers wide, 300 kilometers long, and represented 11,000 square kilometers of ice. That's about the same size as the country of Jamaica. And it began its slow journey towards this little island with a volcano on it <clears throat> called Ross Island, where for the last 10 years, I've been engaged in a, a project to conserve the historic huts of the Edwardian explorers Scott, Shackleton, and Borgreving. These chaps. Now, this photo was taken from a helicopter along the leading edge of B-15 as it thundered up McMurdo Sound at about this pace. Let me thunder. Okay, so it's not setting any speed records it was as it was doing this, but you've got to remember that this part of the ice that we can see poking up above the water represents only one-tenth of the volume of the iceberg. It was estimated that B-15 held 3.5 trillion tons of ice, so not something that you'd want to get in the way of, which was demonstrated in the spring of 2005 when the slightly smaller B-15A bonked into the end of the Drygalski ice pier, ice tongue, and dislodged about 60 square kilometers of it, requiring new charts to be written for the whole region. Now, when the ice finally hung itself up on a seamount near Cape Adair, it broke up very rapidly over a short period of time. And the scientists who were on site at the time monitoring it said that it sounded, it, sorry, it broke up like a crystal wine glass being sung to by a heavy soprano. And they recorded it. This is what it sounded like. Okay, what was interesting about this event, though, was that it happened very quickly over a period of just a few days, and these same scientists have since presented evidence that the event that pre precipitated the breakup of B-15 started six days earlier and 15,500 kilometers away at a storm event in the Gulf of Alaska. It took those six days for the waves to travel the length of the globe to the Antarctic where they heaved the ice and broke it up. Now, this little area just to the west of Ross Island is, is called McMurdo Sound. Now, normally, in the Austral summer, the ice, which is called fast ice in McMurdo Sound, will break up, and it will drift out into the South Antarctic Ocean where it's dissipated, and the next season, it will reset and form up again. But with B-15 clogging up the end of the sound, that couldn't happen. And that brought all sorts of changes to the region and obviously turned the Antarctic programs on their heads as well. This was particularly bad news for these fellows. For the penguins that live in the Ross Sea now found that they had to walk 70 kilometers to find open water in which to feed. It brought other changes to the region as well. And one of the things that we found well, during that time was that there were unusually large accumulations of snow. Now, this is a picture of Scott's hut that was taken in 1911. And this is what the hut looked like when I first arrived in the Ross Sea as my first part of the program. We found ourselves digging through blue water ice and uh, drifted snow up to six meters deep just to reach the huts. Now, Antarctica is the land of wind and snow, and uh, it's natural that people assume that there is a lot of precipitation and a lot of snowfall in Antarctica, but in fact, the opposite is true. Antarctica is largely a desert, so this was extremely unusual. And it brought all sorts of unexpected changes to our program. The weight 
of the snow on tops of these on tops of these buildings that had stood for almost a century in the harsh Antarctic climate was causing the rafters in these buildings to snap and break like dry twigs. And then in a very ironic twist, there was a flood event. And the reason for this is that the huts are the only dark objects on an otherwise very bleak and white landscape, so they're subject to quite a lot of solar gain. They warm up, and as the air inside the huts warms up, it causes the snow built up around them to melt and flood into the huts, and it flowed everywhere. And it raised the humidity inside these huts, which caused all sorts of damage to the precious artifacts that are inside them. Molds started to grow. Objects which had been frozen for decades now began to thaw out. And even in the dry desert air of the Antarctic, the buildings and their contents began to rot. Now this was really bad news for us. Because we had, tra we had traveled to the bottom end of the planet to conserve these buildings, and we had arrived with all of these carefully laid plans to find that these massive events had turned our project on its head. And the real problem here was this. We had no idea how to respond. And we had very little time in which to do it. The ice, sorry, the water which had flowed into these buildings had refrozen, and it was quite literally squeezing the structures of these little buildings apart at the seams. And despite all of the technological advances in the last century, we felt there was a very real chance that these little buildings were about to perish under our watch. But the real problem was that there was no precedent. There was nowhere we could turn to for lessons learned. Now, normally, building conservators, which are a fairly specialized breed, tend to consult amongst themselves. Like many branches of specialized, specialized science, building conservators have developed their own peculiar language. We use jargon like character-defining elements or uh, statements of significance to communicate very specific ideas to one another. And of course, most other people can't understand what the heck we're talking about. And this makes us feel very clever. Now, this isn't peculiar to building conservation. I think this happens in most areas of specialization. But the problem, which should seem obvious, is that the more specialized our language, the more jargon-rich it is, the more geeky our specialized fields may be, the, t the closer we are to the pointy end of that wedge of specialization, the more inclined we are to consult amongst ourselves and to consult inwards rather than to face outwards and consult with others beyond our sphere. And in this case, that simply wouldn't work because our colleagues, our club of experts and like-minded people, had no clue how to solve these problems. So what's this got to do with transformation? Well, I'd like to describe briefly how B15 impacted on my professional life and caused my team and I to rethink the way that we went about solving problems. We knew <laughs> that we hadn't a hope of solving these problems on our own and that we would have to consult outside our group. And the first time that this happened on the ice, uh, I remember very clearly, I had this problem. A, a, as I described, there's a lot of water issues with these buildings. We desperately needed to turn off the tap. And as I looked at the ground surrounding the buildings, especially here um, at, at Cape Evans, I looked through the, the strata of the soils and I could see water moving in one direction on one layer, between layers of frozen ground, and in the opposite direction, a little bit lower down on the ground. I've never seen anything like this before, and I had no idea how to deal with it and to keep it out of the hut. So I started, pretty naturally, Googling around on the internet and doing Boolean searches using keywords like uh, groundwater uh, mitigation and permafrost conditions and papers, hoping that I could tap into some uh, expertise or find some paper written on the subject. Well, it didn't take very long for me to realize that, A, there was no silver bullet waiting out there. I wasn't going to discover the, uh, the research paper that had been written about um, managing this sort of problem. But B, I started to discover who else was doing interest, uh, um, similar sorts of work. So 
I reached out to them. I, I picked up the phone and I started calling people pretty randomly, I must say, at first. And I ended up chatting with some people at the Cold Climate Research Center in Alaska. Now, these people don't know very much about what's going on in the Antarctic, but they know a lot about managing cold in buildings. And I explained our problem and I said I was stumped. And mo most importantly, I asked the question, can you help me? And they very generously said that they would do what they could and pass the word around. And I didn't think that much would come of it. But later that evening, I received an email from one of these people. And they said, I remember meeting somebody at a conference a few years ago who bizarrely was doing similar work. And you might want to give them a call and let me connect you, etc." So a few emails were exchanged. And before I know it, here I was with this uh, phone number from this chap called Robert. So I phoned Robert up. I said, here's my problem, I explained. And he said, oh, oh yeah, no, I know exactly what you're talking about. And it turned out that he did. Robert was, in, was one of those uber specialists. He had spent um, a, peculiar amount of his, a peculiar amount of his career studying this very bizarrely, uh, um, this, very, this very strange and peculiar set of circumstances around groundwater and permafrost. And we started to yak, and we were going on for about half an hour before I said, well, we, we've got to meet. Um, you know, you, this, this, is, this is fantastic. Can I come and see you? He said, ah, well, a mm, bit of a hitch. Because it turns out that Robert, this guy that I was chatting with, was quite literally speaking to me from a top-secret underground laboratory at a place called the Cold Regions Research and Engineering Lab, which is a division of the US Army Corps of Engineers. And over the next couple of weeks, as Robert and his colleagues gathered together and helped us develop strategies for solving this problem in the Antarctic, uh, I had this really interesting learning. Here were these guys, these incredible scientists huddled around a speakerphone in some underground top secret lab that I was trying to imagine. And they were so generously contributing ideas towards solving this problem in the Antarctic. And I thought, hey, how cool is this? But what was really going on here was that Robert and his colleagues were teaching us about a new way of problem solving and a new way to collaborate. Now, the, the solution that Robert helped us develop is incredibly boring. It worked very well, fortunately, and it involved doing a topographical survey of the land and in putting all of these interference dams in and managing the water and then putting a series of membranes on the sides of the huts, etc. That's not the point. The point is that none of this would have been possible without our reaching outside of our normal sphere to this outside world of consultants and tapping into this expertise that exists beyond our specialization in the broader world of government in these places that are much better funded than building conservators. I'll give you another couple of examples. So as I said, we had a lot of problems managing snow. There was heaps of snow in the area. We took this problem, again, away from the community of our like-minded souls who didn't have a clue, faced outwards, put the challenge out into the broader community. We tapped into this really neat guy called um, Robert Blindsdale, who works with the NSF. And Robert, as it happened, had spent the last 10 years trying to blow snow off ice runways to save the NSF a fortune in grooming. And there are a couple of ice runways in this part of the world. He helped us develop the vortex generators that we use. These are big, couple of meter wide delta wings on articulated foundations. And they turn in the wind and they concentrate the ambient wind into a stream which scours the landscape and blows it clear of snow. And you can see the effect of this in the landscape behind. I'll show you another example. A couple of years later, same project, and this is the interior of Scott's hut. And as I've said, all of this water which had flooded into the buildings had seeped away somewhere. Now, I quite literally staked my credibility and career on this one because I, I, was, I was sure that this water was bound beneath the floor somewhere and that it must have been refrozen beneath the floor, the, <clears throat> the floor coverings and inside the walls. So I convinced my colleagues to open up the hut. But that wasn't solution enough. There were all of these little nooks and crannies that we just couldn't reach. There was no way that we could get in there to remove that water. Once again, we turned outside our group and we tapped into this bizarre and incredibly exciting bit of expertise that lies in the world of offshore yachting. 
These are these multi-million dollar yachts that race around the world once or twice a decade. And they have, they're very well funded and they have big teams of people working on them. Well, it turns out that when they race in the southern latitudes, the condensation that builds up inside the hulls tends to freeze and that little bit of extra weight in the hull can make the difference between a yacht placing or winning. This is very important to them, so they've invested a lot in solving the problem. Well, we tapped into this, brought them into our design team, these guys, and they very generously showed us what they'd learned. And we created this machine, which turned hot, hot um, heat energy generated from a diesel, a diesel boiler outside the buildings into boiling glycol that we could then pipe into the buildings, run through this very complex heat exchange unit, turn into hot air, and then blow into the joist cavities and the walls. And then when we harvested that warm, moisture-laden air and vented it to the dry Antarctic desert outside, we could literally monitor our progress by looking at the amount of snow we were making out of the exhaust pipe of this crazy machine. This is what that looked like. So here we are opening up the floor inside Scott's Terra Nova hut. And fortunately for my credibility, finding the snow that I had said was there, and here's the crazy machine in all its glory inside the building. And here's the building put back together again later. Okay. The take-home message that I've brought to share is this. When we increasingly specialize, the tendency is that we consult inward. And when we do that, we get quite predictable answers. And we cut off at the knees the potential for a lot of really exciting collaboration to happen, when instead we turn and we face outside and we invite external experts into our sphere and we drop our pretense of expertise and we ask for help. We create the circumstances under which really exciting collaboration can happen. Now, I really wish that I had learned this lesson earlier in my career. It took me a long time to practice it before it became comfortable. And now I can say, and really proudly so, that this group of uh, colleagues that I work with in the Antarctic, this is our starting place. This is routine for us. When we have faced with a new challenge, we routinely face outwards and ask ourselves, OK, where are we going to go with this? Who can we ask? Who can we invite in to work with us on this one? And it's really exciting to work with a team that's minded that way. I wish it hadn't taken me so long. And perhaps you won't have to spend 10 years in the Antarctic to figure it out for yourselves. Thank you. <laughs>